you're ready. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, beautiful. How are you? Thank you for being flexible today. Dan gave me a call a couple of hours ago and asked if I could do this. And I said, you bet, I'd love to. I don't think I've seen you since um, the last Soil and Nutrition Conference, the live one. Exactly. In Massachusetts. Yeah, we had a really lovely conversation there. So I remember right. that. I, think, I remember that vividly. I'm sorry? I remember that conversation and those workshops vividly. Yes. They were really, really powerful. Right. Yes, I do too. All right. I think we have um, enough people join now. We're about two minutes after the hour. So we're going to, going to go ahead and start. Um, I'm really excited today to have uh, Rehi back with us. He is uh, from an area of the country that I grew up in and my ancestors farmed in, which is Southern Minnesota and Northern Iowa. And Rehi has, um, has his farm there that I'm gonna let him tell us a little bit about. Um, it's very exciting what he does there. Um, and he's also gonna, of course, talk about, um, you know, um, the colonized mindset. And this is something that I think is fairly new to a, a lot of people, but I think it's really, really important. Um, I wish that when I was an organizer in Iowa, that this was a tool that I had, information that I had, because I would say in the area of the country where you are raising your family and farming and where I raised my family, the colonized mindset really expresses itself, uh, manifests through agriculture, through industrialized agriculture. And um, I just see what you're doing as um, a revolution. I really do. Um, and you had a wonderful article in the Des Moines Register recently. That was really exciting. And if you wanna talk a little bit about that, that would be great. And I invite everybody to check it out. And if you're live with us today, or if you're listening to the recording, um, please feel free to go and um, check out um, Reggie's other sessions on the Soil and Nutrition Conference. This is, you had the opening ceremony for us, and this is part three um, um, of this um, type of workshop that you've been giving. So I'm just going to let you go ahead and tell us your, tell us your name and a little bit about you and, you know, what you're going to be talking to us about today. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. This is a great opportunity. It's a really good community. It's a place where I believe from the beginning, we established a sense of comfort, of openness, of reality, of intense conversations, a place where we can have the kind of conversations we need to have, not the conversations that are convenient, to have, not the conversations that makes us comfortable yet don't change things. So this is the place to have those conversations that can get us to where we need to go, to that destination we keep uh, dreaming of and aspiring to. And to put it in context, you know, in Guatemala, I have said this many times, we have a saying that if you don't know where you're going, every bus will take you there. And unfortunately, this seems to have become an MO, an operating um, modus operandi of a lot of our organizations and businesses, farm businesses and businesses of the middle that, yeah, we set goals and business objectives, but we rarely ask the question to what end? What is the end purpose of succeeding at selling chicken, selling vegetables? Deploying a successful, profitable farm operation, for example. Is that the end? Is there anything beyond that? And if that's the end, then we are failing at the fundamentals of understanding systems change. Because systems don't change because we are successful individually as farmers. Even if there is millions of us, individually, we don't account for systems change. And that, unfortunately, that individualism that entrenched individualism is the result of a long, according to some folks like Sherry Mitchell, um, anthropologist and historian that wrote a book um, about sacred 
called sacred instructions. Uh, there is over 3,000 years of colonization that have shaped the way we think, act, and the way we are. Now is a way of being. Colonizers, we are colonizers as a way of being. And that is fundamentally getting in the way of us being able to achieve a destination that we can align behind in the context of regenerating the planet, in the context of restoring justice in the relationships within people, restoring a balance and respect, integrity in the relation between us and the land, between us and the animals that we raise, that we eat, the plants that we eat, that we grow, the relationship between us and the bodies of water, those that move uh, in, in front of our eyes, like rivers and creeks, and those that move without us knowing, like lakes and the ocean. Well, the ocean, I guess, we, we can see it move. But the ability to actually see through all of those layers, we have lost it. And as we lost that, we, that entrenched individualism has become our worst enemy because it is that entrenched individualism is the result of the full colonization of the mind, which is a, the ultimate purpose of a system that seeks to extract everything out of all of us in the natural world. And as a result of that, compromise the very biophysical and chemical processes and the abundant diversity of life on earth, which is the foundation of our own existence and the existence of all of the other living systems, which combined represents the very reason we are alive today. So that I hope frames today's conversation because we are not going to talk about chickens. We're not gonna talk about many of the things that we cover on the last presentations. If you want, to see the application of today's um, expose, if you want to call it, and today's you know, uh, exposure to potentially a very different way of thinking and acting and being. If you want some of the application, then go back to the previous presentations and you will see how today we're gonna culminate this multitude of, of, comf of, of gatherings with but they, that ultimate destination that I hope you would agree we need to pursue collectively. So, um, so that was 10 minutes of introduction, of framing, and call it a meditation because it truly is the necessary step before we go into uh, today's content. The, um, the process today is gonna be a bit different. I will just stick to the very fundamentals uh, of the topic of decolonization and governance. And my hope is that at the end, you would contribute your own understanding by expressing um, and responding to very specific questions. And we'll dedicate a lot of time to that. So let me go through this framing and through this process so that then you know, hopefully you would also prepare questions and feel free to ask them as we go. They will be recorded and then we can address those quickly and then move on to an actual exercise of, of organizing. That is the foundation of today. So here, and I will have Lisa verified that this is showing properly. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> okay. So, the concept of indigenizing ecosystems, management, and governance, and organizing for collective success. We normally organize for individual success. We organize our friends, our family, our markets for the individual success of our farms. We also organize farmers and work with them, whether we're companies or nonprofits, we organize them for our individual company or, or, or nonprofit success. But it's still entrenched in individualism. Even if there is a lot of people involved, 
that doesn't mean we are a collective and that we organize for collective success. We're always tripping over each other. We're always trying to put somebody down, always trying to be above or ahead of someone. That is the nature of the fully colonized mind. Now, we're never gonna escape that. Let's understand that we are born both indigenous and colonizers. Indigenous understood not from the context of native peoples, but understood from the fundamental principle that we are fundamentally a carbon-based life form. No more, no less than the carbon foundation of the life of a worm or a grasshopper or a cow or a chicken. We are simply at the basic fundamental biophysical and chemical level, we are a carbon-based life form. And as such, we are made of the elements of the earth. And as a result of that, we are indigenous to the earth, all of us. That's the beauty of the indigenous mindset. It's non-discriminatory, it's non-exclusive, it's 100% inclusive. And within that inclusivity, we, and, and within that indigenized mind, we must see ourselves as part of the living systems of the earth, not outside of those systems. We don't work with nature. We can't because we are nature. We don't work with ecosystems because we are eco the part of the ecosystems. We work within those ecosystems. And every action that we take affects every single component of those ecosystems that have evolved over billions of years to generate this carbon-based life form that we call humans, but not, not in isolation of all of the millions of other life forms to which we owe our own existence, our health, and our ability to actually be the fullest quality of human being that we were, that we evolved to be, and that we're given that potential to be. Nobody can take that away. That understanding and translating that into a way of being, into a way of living, is what makes us indigenous or not. Now, there is a lot of native communities and primarily native communities like Lakotas, Lakotas, Mayan, within the Maya, we have multitude of native uh, subgroups that have preserved that way of being and thinking that is indigenous. And as a result of that, today I'm responsible for having preserved over 80% of the global biodiversity in less than 20% of the total landscape, uh, the total land base surface of the earth and with no more than 370 million members in those communities. A lot of them also already compromised by the colonizing systems that now dominate those communities. So with the, and, and, and on top of all of that, these communities, these people who are still indigenous have also done so and achieved such a great, a great level of regenerating and maintaining the capacity of the ecosystems to regenerate in the face of hundreds, centuries of years of repression, genocide, constant attacks, constant expropriation of their knowledge and wisdom and resources, constant invasion of pipelines, mining corporations, constant invasion of capital, appropriation of their ways, and then turn into claims that now are being called regenerative, but yet to only partially to prop up more colonizing structures, brands, companies that have lost the public trust and now appropriate indigenous ways and then reduce them to two or three or four claims, call them regenerative and get a second life or a third life for the brands or companies. That is the situation under which 
native communities around the world who practice indigenous ways have been able to, able to achieve the greatest movement in regeneration and sustenance of ecosystems that we have ever seen. That is where the credit belongs. That is where true regeneration is happening. And that way of being and doing things is grounded in an understanding of the whole ecosystem, the whole ecosystem. We are not just talking about plants and animals and, and, and so on. We're talking about the whole ecosystem, which includes governance, ownership, control, relationship between people, even relationships within the animals themselves and understanding that so that we know the consequences of interfering with their relationships even if we are not necessarily eating them. All kinds of layer, layers and levels of understanding that generate our ability or regenerate our ability to tap into our original innate intelligence and the acquired indigenous knowledge and intellect that only develops when we are identified with our original way of being which is indigenous to the earth. Within that context is that we can organize, we indigenize how we manage and govern ecosystems going forward. If we are to solve the challenges that we are facing today at a global scale, that is what it means to organize for collective success. And that is a whole different field of thought and a whole different field of uh, professional understanding of our roles within this ecosystem. So the decolonization we're talking about is, as we have discussed before, is subversive, is radical in its departure point. It is completely nature-based, nature inclusive of us. It's insurgent because it builds in us and ignites a fire that turns us into passionate, passionate advocates for the truth and for true original ways of being rather than into individuals who seek to advance our individual interest or the individual interest of our nonprofits and businesses at the cost of appropriating and denigrating the original concepts that were developed over centuries to build regenerative ways. So that ignition of that energy and that commitment to even give your life, like so many hundreds of thousands of, in, of native people around the world have done so on behalf of the earth and the rights of the earth, that is, what makes a uh, insurgent is not about violently, you know, protesting, say the military in Guatemala, like we understand a lot of the insurgency. Insurgency is really the ability to get to that level of commitment that makes you not only passionately peaceful, but also that peacefulness emerges, emerges from our fundamental understanding that we're indigenous to the earth and that life and the giving of life and the optimum expression, the optimization of the expression of all kinds of life is the greatest purpose that we can live for. That is the proper definition of an insurgency and an insurgent mindset. Everything else is the result of manipulation. It's revolutionary and like Lisa's point about this. Yes, we are engaged in a revolution. And that's what we need to base everything we do in this subversive departure and this insurgent spirit. Without those two, you can't build a revolution because revolution are things that we do at scale that requires that everyone understands what is the common destination. Otherwise, any idea will get us there. And when that is the case, anyone can manipulate our way and keep us from our final destination. It's evolutionary 
we have, must be evolutionary because we have to adapt. We need to be agile. We need to be resilient in the face of this incredible power that has been annihilated, suppressing any attempt by all of these native communities around the world to protect the water systems, especially right now. You can see that first page, you know, with, with line three, you saw it at Standing Rock. You can go in anywhere in the world. The scale at which we are being attacked, if we stand for the rights of communities, of the earth, of the water systems and all that, the level of criminalization of that, of that aspect of our right to be human is so massive that we must evolve as those threats also evolve against us as communities, as individuals, and, as, and, and against the very foundation of what gives us life, which is water, carbon in the air, all of these other elements of the earth, and the balance that they existed in order to generate the living systems that we, have, that we can enjoy today, and whose disruption results in the degeneration of life and the extinction of life at a mass scale. That is why we must be adaptable, agile, res and resilient. And nothing, nothing is more expressive of those things than the efforts of native communities around the world for hundreds and hundreds of years, which we must fully understand and must bring back into the forefront of how we approach the whole concept of achieving a regenerative, uncompromising destination. Now, in the previous presentations, we saw, we looked at this diagram from our poultry system where we have applied all of, the, all of these concepts in a dis disciplined, methodical, and systemic way. Now, all I'm gonna say about this is that what we're looking at is the consolidation of the interrelationship between animals and living systems as we seek to work within these natural systems, not as producers of anything, but rather as stewards of energy transformation from non-edible forms. Multiple parts of this diagram shows non-edible forms of energy, whether it is manure, whether it is, you know, grain that we can't just put in the plate and eat, uh, whether it is equipment or other things like that. And then the process by which we organize the enterprise sectors that then bring this energy into flows that then are turned into edible forms that we can put on our plate. Now we had another slide where we went through the on-farm based process of transforming, process of understanding and stewarding the transformation of energy from non-edible into edible forms, non-edible in the form of carbon and nitrogen and in the air and in the soil and all of that, and manure and leaves and twigs and whatever it is that the energy expressions in your land uh, are into edible forms, such as hazelnuts, chickens and eggs and all of those other forms that we can either put into a process of enterprise management so that we can transform them further so they become edible or are edible right off the farm. Either way, we are engaged, not in the production of things, but in the transformation of energy from non-edible into edible forms. And we can then codify that into actual large scale economic, social and ecological blueprints that when applied, allow us to arrive at an ecosystem level of management, at which level then regeneration can happen. A regenerative claim cannot be on a farm or a product. Regenerative claims are only applicable to ecosystems because only ecosystems have the capacity to regenerate. Chickens or pigs or cows, they don't regenerate. Trees, don't regenerate by themselves either. Cover crops, that's not regenerative. 
if not within an ecosystem level application. So we must understand that in order to regenerate, in order to create regenerative outcomes or achieve that outcome, we must understand that only ecosystems regenerate and ecosystems understood from their true concept. For example, one ecosystem we're looking at because we, I am in North Hill, Minnesota, and we are on the flyway, on the pathway of multitude of migratory birds from geese to ducks, to migratory birds from all other forms. Um, blue jays that do regional migration to chickadees all the way to birds that go all the way from Canada down south, plus others that go even internationally. We are in that flyway. And to the extent that these ecosystems evolved over billions of years with that kind of interaction from the air, the soil, the, the, the water around here and all of that, then those ecosystems achieved a capacity to self-perpetuate, which is the fundamental concept of regeneration. And they did that by becoming super efficient energy transformers. Remember that energy cannot be, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed. And so those ecosystems became extremely uh, adept and sophisticated at the process of regeneration. As we interfere with them and build farms, it doesn't matter how much we do on that farm. If, though, if that farm becomes, the, it becomes a fundamental pivoting point from which we fragment and separate the, the, those different life forms and systems within an ecosystem, that ecosystem then decreases in its capacity to regenerate to the point that when we raise a chicken here in our system, that chicken can only be regenerative if the ecosystem itself can regenerate. And there is no such thing as an actual regenerative chicken. We are doing our best to put this chicken within an ecosystem management framework, yes. But for that ecosystem to actually regenerate and deliver us the regenerative capacity that is necessary to fix today's global challenge with climate and all of those things, hunger, malnutrition, water quality, and all of that, we must regenerate the ecosystems at that scale. And that means defragmenting the landscape, restoring native species and all of that, but not at a farm level. So a product and a farm are fundamentally incapable of regenerating. Only ecosystems do. So compare that with the claims we are seeing all over the place today, and then you'll understand why it is important that we decolonize our minds and then reclaim our indigenous understanding and ways of being and doing things so that when then we can bring back to the extent that we have to because of the way we, the, the mass influence of the conventional systems on us, then at least we can codify those ways into something that can be applicable, like this diagram, to the real conditions we have to operate under. But there is no need to compromise the ultimate destination, which is an actual regenerative ecosystem level of management. Now, the hardest thing for us to to move the, the hardest thing and the biggest barrier we have in moving forward. It's not markets, capital, line, none of those, none of those things. It's actually our culture. Our culture is what defines why uh, the, the ways, the individual ways and the standalone, whether at businesses, farm businesses, you know, a farm, a 40 acre farm, in my case, 75 acre farm, or a nonprofit or a company, no matter how big, we tend to always go back to the individual. And even though that is important, we, we have not yet learned to understand that our, our individual, from a regenerative framework perspective, of course, our individual success is only possible through the movement towards ecosystem level management which then leads to systems change, which then changes the conditions on which we live, on which we work, and how 
they, those ecosystems or that system defines what we can and cannot do on the land. So when you hear cover crops, soil health, and all of those things, those are absolutely critical elements and stepping stones towards a regenerative future. But those practices are governed and defined by the ecosystem that we operate under, by the system. So think of it from this perspective. The United States Department of Agriculture is an ecosystem level management institution. And the systems that it perpetuates are the systems that dominate and define what you can and cannot do on your land at a scale, meaning collectively. Now, some of us may be able to get away with stuff that, that is not supported by the USDA. In fact, most of us doing regenerative agriculture can't access almost any program. And if we do access some USDA programs, very, very limited. The bulk of it, and I would say probably over 95% of all of that ecosystem management is aimed at perpetuating a system that extracts, degenerates, and destroys the very foundation of the living systems that define whether we can feed the world now and going forward. That is an ecosystem or a system level institution. And if we do not change that level of ecosystem level management, it won't matter how much we want to do things right on the farm. We will always be one single line item on a bill from going bankrupt again. Now, it doesn't mean that it's hopeless. And in fact, we can organize. But the problem is, and this is where we need to focus our energy, is on this very specific problem, because we are the problem. We, our in, entrenched individualism, is the problem our lack of understanding of our indigenousness and our indigenous intellect and capabilities, that is the problem. Our inability to understand collective impact versus institutional, I mean, versus organizational or individual business impact, that is where we are stuck. And I hope as you see this diagram and we spell it out, excuse me, I spell it out, you will decodify your own mindset reorganize your synapses and your brain patterns and reorganize them to see all of these connections that are expressed in this diagram and think from a perspective of the infrastructure of mycelia, which generates full ecosystem interactions and thrives as a collective body formed of millions of individual bodies that understand the importance of the collective biological, physical, and chemical infrastructure on which they depend. So when we can interpret that and look at ourselves within the larger agriculture ecosystem and understand those interactions and the absolute importance of understanding collective impact as a foundation of our individual success and how our individual success aggregated is the expression of collective impact and collective success. Those back and forth exercises, I hope, will generate a new way of thinking for us. So look at the outer perimeter uh, circle, the next circle, the next circle, and then the center of this. And then let's go back to the outer perimeter, the grassroots, the first layer, what we call affinity groups. This is what represents, at the end of the day, the maximum authority of the system. That's us, farmers, and our organizations, our affinity groups. That is what we would call, in the context of ecosystem management, the National Assembly. And you'll see how this comes out. What defines that? It's a localized collective of individual operations, family farms. So for example, I'm a, I'm a, a poultry grower. Now, as a poultry grower, I can, you know, I, I'm working on developing a regional, a regional collective of individual operations, family farms, that then we can form an affinity group focused and define 
by a clear common set of goals and objectives, which allows us to thrive and support our operations as poultry growers, broilers more specifically. We then, as a collective, develop a governing structure. We democratically elect a council, and then that council is formed by us, by those of us directly growing chickens, so that decisions that we make for the collective also directly affect our own family farms. And as a result of that, we have an immediate feedback uh, effect or a feedback loop to the decisions we make and we are accountable to the collective, but also to ourselves, to our children, their children, to our significant others, and to everyone around. That level of accountability is unheard of in non-Indigenous communities or non-Native communities. In affinity group, it's also self-dependent organized. Any one, any identity, any reason to organize, as long as common goals and objectives can be articulated and deployed within a strategic framework so that they can be implemented, then a, uh, an affinity group can emerge. So examples of these affinity groups, the regenerative broiler farmers I was talking about. Egg layer farmers is a different affinity group because broilers and egg layers are such different animals that the goals and objectives of egg layer and farmers are very different than the goals and objectives of broiler farms. Even the infrastructure is different. The feed is different. The ranging aspects, the size of production units, is different. all of these things separate those groups so that we can, they, they, we can zero down in, um, into a space that is so, so specific that it's easy to come up with common goals and common objectives without, um, without too much discussion as to what is a common goal and objective. For example, for us, one of our common goals or common objectives, sorry, is to deploy poultry processing. It's central for us as broiler growers. Now we don't need that for egg layers because if we do that for broilers, we can always cooperate with the egg layer farms who don't produce chickens that need to go to the processor every week and then when they have their egg layers ready for processing, we can process them. Egg layer, the egg laying affinity group, egg layer farmers affinity group, doesn't have to be concerned with processing poultry if we, if we coordinate uh, with the broiler uh, affinity group. Turkey farmers, very different. Too. Vastly different from egg layers and broilers. It's still poultry, but it is a larger animal. It takes a whole year to raise a flock long economic turnarounds. Uh, the goals and objectives of the turkey farmer uh, affinity group are very different than egg layers and broilers. But by, by, by focusing at that level, we can then build the next layer, which I will show you how those three different groups can then become one without tangling themselves and interfering with each other and creating confusion in creating never ending meetings after meetings after meetings, trying to come up with common goals and objectives because they are not trying to solve each other's problems, but rather build infrastructure so that they, each of these groups can solve those problems or those and tackle, tackle those opportunities that are unique to their affinity group while collectively with the other affinity groups, tackling those common goals and objectives that are actually common to all the different layers. I happen to be a Latin American immigrant, and I am also a broiler grower. Uh, very soon, in a couple of years, I also will be raising egg layers. Now, I can be part of three affinity groups. It's up to me. Nobody can tell me what to do. I can define where I'm best represented. That is central to democratic decision-making process of, uh, to decolonization of governance and control. And so as a Latin American immigrant, I may just join with other Latin American immigrants uh, who may be poultry growers or maybe are part of other groups like pork and, and cattle. Why? Because the common goals and objectives will be defined by those things that we find in common associated with our Latin American immigrant status. So that's what defines us as an affinity group, not, the, not what kind of farming we do. But I can also 
be defined and I am also defined by the kind of farming I do. Those two different aspects of my life don't necessarily mix all the time. You know, to deploy a poultry processing facility or to operate under a standard for broilers, it doesn't, doesn't have to be a Latin American immigrant. My Latin American immigrant uh, challenges and barriers, discrimination, racism, and all of that are not gonna be solved by the fact that we collectively came together as broiler growers to build a processing facility. Those will be resolved by coming together as Latin American immigrant farmers. And then within that affinity group, we deal with those common goals and objectives associated with the fact that we are immigrants. And that kind of sets us into this group that, that has to resolve certain issues that only are common because of that. Same with Hmong, grass-fed beef farmers could be another example. Yeah, LGBTQ farmers, for example, we are, I'm part of the board of directors of Moses, and we are paying a lot of attention to that group because it has been so brutally discriminated up against by farmers of the same color. Uh, doesn't have to be different color skin or immigrant status. In fact, it's, it's incredible to see the, the kind of repression and discrimination against the LD, LBGT, LBGTQ plus uh, community of farmers. Organic certified farmers, to me, it's an affinity group. Um, uh, that's, it's, it's a set of practices that are not necessarily regenerative, uh, but it's important. It's an important steps, like cover crops and other things, are important steps in eliminating a lot of bad stuff that is put on the land and a lot of uh, poorly designed organizational systems that existed before farmers become, exist before, unless farmers are certified organic. That was the standards set them apart as well as an affinity group. Okay, so once we understand affinity groups, then we can move to the second layer, which is organizing for governance for control. That's the second layer. In this case, we're looking at the consuls organized within the affinity groups who, who, who elected their consuls of those who are actually directly affected by the decisions that we said. Average of the Council of Affinity Groups is the representation, for example, of the poultry sector. So it's an affinity group um, based on consuls, identified with local and regional common goals and objectives again. Um, its goals and objectives are defined by the keys to the success of affinity groups in the first layer. Now remember, the affinity group at the first layer, at the localized la layer, say broilers, they, they are defined by the success of the families who participate in that. So equally, a second tier or second layer um, level of organi organizing represents, is defined by the objectives of those affinity groups. It's also democratically elected um, from council members or representatives that affinity groups may say, may elect democratically to represent them at the regional councils. And so examples of this could be, for example, the um, Regional Poultry Producers Council, which will be inclusive of, old, of, of broilers, egg layers, and turkey. So this Regional Poultry Producer Council, a council or councils can be developed all over the country based on a multitude of characteristics because collectively, as affinity groups, we will need capital, we will need infrastructure. And even if that infrastructure is, is different for each one of our lines of, of interest, common interest production wise, the infrastructure itself can be combined into regional, what we call in development parks, like you saw in the diagram way back, that can then simplify, expedite and accelerate the process by which we build the infrastructure for our individual uh, affinity groups. And so that fulfills that responsibility that defines this second layer, which is the success of each affinity group. And then each affinity group, as a result of this collective effort, then defines the success, their success because their own members, the individual farms, then will have access to infrastructure and on and on goes, the layer goes. We, for example, could have another second layer with large livestock uh, groups, bison, cattle, and I don't know what else we'll put in there. Mid-sized livestock council could be sheep, pork, goats. They share 
even though as affinity groups, they don't share much in common and that's why they have to be individual affinity groups. Collectively, they also need processing facilities. They need potentially collective branding, capital and support infrastructure and so on. Now you could now take each one of these three top second layer affinity groups and put another layer of common interests such as policy and governance at, you know, and relationships with government institutions, for example, we'll look into that in a second. So just to give you a clear idea on how this evolves and hopefully creates these new patterns in your mind, the third layer of organizing is those regional councils. They represent second layer consoles, organize and focus on common goals and objectives again. For us, we have been looking at the driftless region, which is the border, the, 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 you know, we call it the driftless, even though there's only a certain specific targeted geographical region called driftless. Um, uh, we are thinking of Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. And then within those, that region, we can have multiple consoles of multiple different areas by, I mean, um, beef, pork, the three areas of poultry and so on. And then we create that next layer, the third layer of organizing so that we can systemically coordinate ourselves uh, without confusing and without getting distracted and without spending years or decades trying to figure out how is it that we can work together because those common goals and objectives are defined at that level rather than at the farm level where, where the affinity group is perfectly capable of doing that. The Missouri River Valley, the Great Plains Producer Pool, those are regions of, with various states involved. The Midwest Region, the Financial Council, I, I, we figured that for financial, the financial sector could organize itself into affinity groups, yes, somewhere in the middle of all of that. I know that there is those who do equity, those who do impact investment, those who only do lending, those who land only for infrastructure, uh, those who land for farmland purchases, those that uh, finance transition. There's all, all kinds of different affinity groups, but they don't, they are not as, as defined by the locality as say poultry producers. We can only develop a, a affinity group of poultry producers, broilers, for example, within say two hours of a processing facility because more than that, it, it becomes impractical and, and economically not feasible to transport chickens. Now, financial institutions don't have those limitations. So the criteria that defines them is very different, but still, we can still use the same blueprint to organizing that sector as well and many others. At the end, what you have is what we are calling and want to call, and hopefully you agree, we would have the Regenerative Agriculture Congress of America, where representatives from all third level councils would come together to develop the coordinated governance of all things related to regenerative agriculture in this country. And that council will then be accountable to the General Assembly which is where every single one comes from at any layer of the organizational and governance infrastructure of the whole system. That is what we call systems change. And within that systems change, uh, we build that, that institutional capacity to decolonize the governance and the control and the decision-making of all the, of the ecosystem. That ecosystem then operates on locally verifiable and validated economic, social, and ecological outcomes. It is a triple bottom line design. It centers on ecosystem level governance and management functions, such as the annual convergence, which would be a convergence of all of the multi-layers, and it can be done multiple throughout the year affinity groups can gather to do their localized businesses. Then two, three times a year, uh, those groups or once a year at a different time, they can organize as regional uh, groups as those layers are delineated, so can the convergences. And then once a year, 
we have one convergence where everybody comes together to as a not as a conference the way we normally understand it where there's a whole bunch of talking heads and all kinds of things where everybody's is is concerned about the individualism but rather a convergence where the knowledge exchange is, is managed by the affinity groups themselves and the regional uh, representatives where innovations are exchanged that knowledge and wisdom is exchanged between all of the different sectors by themselves where nobody is superior to anyone but everybody has an opportunity to express the full extent to which they have put their creativity and their innate intelligence and their indigenous intellect acquired through interactions in real life achievements. And they can share that with everyone else unimpeded in us, whatever form they find feasible. And that can be done at all levels, different times of the year, different, um, different affinity groups doing that with each other or within them, their own affinity groups. And then at the end, come into this space where we operate at an ecosystem with the clear intention of achieving a collective competitive advantage and a collective success. And so at this level, we also deal with governing issues, governing relationships within the Congress and the USDA, for example. How are we going to define the investments at the US level? How are we going to defend the integrity of the system? How and who do we, uh, do we authorize and validate to certify the system? That is not something that should be appropriated. That's a function of an ecosystem, not the function of a nonprofit and a few corporations. At this level, we should not be accepting that anymore of each other. We should hold each other accountable. That accreditation can only happen at a council level, at a Congress level, and other critical management functions. That is the concept that I wanted to deliver to you today. And hopefully as a result, we can understand what it truly means to decolonize the mind and to decolonize the way we go forward so that we can then indigenize our ways and actually move towards regenerative ecosystem level outcomes. Back to you, Lisa. There we go. That was amazing, Reggie. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I wrote down a lot of things, so I, I personally have a lot of questions and a lot of things that I would like to um, discuss with you, but I'm going to um, go over here to um, the Q&A, and I see that we had a lot of captive people because we don't have a lot up on the Q&A just yet, so if anyone has anything, please, 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 this is your time to ask questions. Okay, here we have a question from... Lenore Brick, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, here's the question. Are you involved with and presenting your message to the UN Food Summit, which is mostly influenced by a corporate globalization, colonizing mindset, greenwashing, appropriating the intent to take over the food system? Um, and then she says that she wants to you know, get in touch with you about that. Um, she says, since political governing bodies and businesses beyond agribusinesses are not guided by ecosystem governance, do you have a plan on how to educate them, including at legislative information sessions and transition those entrenched systems? That's a good question. Okay, so the first one, no, I'm not presenting. I have not been invited. And Honestly, I haven't had time to think about that. So if somebody is thinking about that, and somebody thinks this would be valuable, and you have the possibilities of influencing those decisions, and you believe that I am dignified enough to do that kind of presentation, um, please help. The um, second thing about transforming the entrenched convention system, there, is a, there are multiple layers of strategic thinking that goes through as we develop this work. 
One of them is what we call the 10, the 1090 rule or the 9010 rule. I like to spend, and I want to, and we have deliberately designed processes and management so that we can spend 90% of our time doing this work and only 10% defending it, which by definition and default means not really working to convince anyone, although we will do that at a 10% rate of our time and effort, 90% of our time, and right now we can't keep up, by the way, 90% of the time is focused on working with those who don't need convincing, who are ready to move. And that gives us a much more effective way of managing our energy, our resources, and, the mo and building the momentum than if we were to spend 90% of our time on those that need convincing right now. Now, of course, we'll get to a point hopefully soon when everybody who's ready to go in this direction is engaged, and then we collectively go and educate and transform uh, other sectors. But that's not my job. That is the job of a collective. You're muted, Lisa. There we go. I loved what you just said about 90% doing and 10% defending. That's, that's, a, that's been a big lesson, if you will. That's come that's come to me when I lived um, in Iowa as an example, you know, and I raised my kids there in Iowa, I started an organization co founded an organization called food democracy now. And we did a lot of, you know, political work, it was like called tip of the spear work. And I'm also a student, however, of like, um, of quantum physics, I guess is probably the simplest way to say that. And so I had to reconcile, you know, what we you know, what we focus upon, we create and really reconcile that with, we as humans are creators. So, you know, with act, my activism in that way, you know, we had a really large list. We amassed a list of a million people. And so I had to really think through and it took me years really to kind of undo that defending and that fighting. Cause I felt like if I'm creating uh, fear through fighting and talking about the problem, the question in my mind is, am I perpetuating the problem? And it, like I said, it took me a lot of years to really move through that. And now my organization, Next Seven, which is about the next seven generations, is really more about that creator space of empowering humans as creators. And I see everything that you are talking about really as you know, a barrier to us moving into that. And that lots of times we are indoctrinated with things that we should be afraid of instead of focusing on our, our wonderful capacity to create, you know, in this beautiful ecosystem that we are, I feel so blessed to be able to be here and be a part of. <laughs> so I, yeah, I really, I really appreciated that, like 90% doing, that's, that's totally spot on. All right, I'm going to look. Okay, how do you see the role of cooperatives within your ecosystem? Another good question. Very important um, business organizing option. That is, I mean, what a cooperative is. A cooperative is understood as a, a way of um, incorporating. It's a business structure. And it comes with rules and regulations which are conducive to more, to more collective decision making and all of that. Um, and by the way, it's not my ecosystem. An ecosystem is nobody's ecosystem. That's the foundation of the decolonization of the mind is, is there is no our ecosystem or your ecosystem. There is only an ecosystem. You can be part of it or not, but it doesn't belong to you nor does it belong to anyone. Uh, so just, just paying attention to language here. Um, so the role of cooperatives within, okay? Take away the your ecosystem and call it, how do you see the role of cooperatives within a regenerative ecosystem? Absolutely critical because they are a very important legal organizing form that is designed to more or less equalize the relationships 
between people, decision makers, and to democratize, um, to, to promote democracy. So yeah, very important. But there are many other forms of legal organizing, nonprofit, uh, nonprofit uh, corporations, for example, are very important as an organizing tool. Now, if you create a nonprofit that is based on the traditional MO of appropriating stories and appropriating other people's work and then claiming it as their own, check how many nonprofits don't say our work, our farmers, ours, ours, ours. They appropriate everything and, and they don't even notice that they do it in the language that they use in their, in their websites and then their communications. So yeah, to the extent that you're not doing that and colonizing this space, then nonprofit structures are also critical, just like cooperatives and C corps and LLCs. I mean, a farmer, a farmer isn't going to be a co-op or a nonprofit. It's likely going to be an LLC. So that is also critical, and it depends on where in the ecosystem you are, what part of the ecosystem you are talking about. The different tools can be applied to achieve different outcomes as long as those outcomes are, the, are aimed at the final destination of a regenerative system and that whatever you do with those tools leads to that destination, then they are critical to the ecosystem. Um, so definitely, I would like to put it in that broader perspective so that we understand that there is no one thing no one, one, one thing or one, one fix to any of this. Uh, there's no silver bullet. The, the only thing that, that matters is whether there is alignment and whether we are actually aiming in the same, towards the same destination. Yeah, that's a big, that's a really big challenge. I, I struggle with that a lot with language, languaging. Oh, I, I, that that perked me up what you were saying about are this and are that and I struggle with that I feel like lots of times when I try to you know as an organizational leader have language that I feel is more in alignment with what I know to be true I feel like it's woo woo <laughs> or I feel like people they'll, they'll interpret it that way or they won't understand it or whatever so you know I think it does take you know people like yourself, you know, being that example of being willing to, to break out of that mold. And, you know, and then that way we can recognize that colonization, you know, in a lot of ways. I mean, it's in our, it's in our vernacular and it, and it does take, it does take time, I think, to move through keep, that. Keep in mind that this is a matter of standards of way and ways of being. And how do we use uh, overarching principles as guiding lights, you know, mm. guiding, um, what do you call those lights in the, for the ocean ships? A beacon, you know, a lighthouse, a beacon. Lighthouses. Yeah, how do we take those lighthouses called principles and shine them and, and then listen to and, and guide ourselves, our boats and all of that by them, knowing and completely aware that we will crash into rocks here and there that we are not perfect, that we will make wrong turns. So that none of us, despite our standards and our, the guiding principles are ever held to such a point that we become idols uh, that re represent any form of perfection or anything like that. In that way, we can equalize the landscape so that we can all feel that wherever we are in that ocean, and how far we may be from the lighthouse, is still that lighthouse is the same that guides us all, no matter where, where we are crashing, who we are crashing against and all of that. That is critical because too often we come up with this idea that somebody's got all the answers. And that, that's the idealization, which this culture is so good at. And as a result of that, we kill the very opportunity to be the optimum or to optimize our way of being because we're always looking at someone else, not within. And that, it, it requires understanding that everybody is in the journey, nobody has arrived at the destination. And some of us have happened to have been um, you know, pushed a little bit along by life, uh, 
life's uh, cruelty in a way, you know? I mean, uh, the, the, the kind of stuff we have to go, I have to go through personally, and many, many brown people in this country, many black people in this country, many Asian people in this country, no white person ever experiences that. And I mean, but I'm not saying that, you know, white, white people are not encountering their own challenges. Um, and we, we, but we, as we always have done throughout our geoevolutionary processes, we have always been defined both by our successes and our failures and our crisis and our times of peace and everything. Now, we are born both colonizers and indigenous. It is the one we feed, the one that becomes the dominant force. And unfortunately, we have fed our colonizing selves and we have incentivized and built whole ecosystems to incentivize the colonizing nature of, of our being. And as a result of that, it is no coincidence that in the name of feeding the world, we are destroying and wrecking the very foundation on which we depend to feed the world. Yeah. That is fundamental to understand because then we will see ourselves within that ecosystem and that journey and then know that we have as much to contribute as anybody who stands in front of a group like I'm doing right now and you uh, anywhere on earth. And that is the power of a true insurgency, intellectual insurgency. Mm. Very well said. Thank you so much for that. Oh, that was good. All right, I'm gonna read a question from David Stronach. Thank you, Reggie. How do you feel about the approaches that incentivize individuals to behaviors that support the collective system, but may not require the individuals to be conscious of that same collective? For example, a market focused on natural nutritional quality of foods which aligns behavior with systemic values and even create a sense of agency to be creative, even if the individuals do not see their own role in the broader system. Is this good, bad, or otherwise in your perspective? Um, well, there is no bad when the step is in the right direction. Right. The only bad would be in the opposite direction. So an organic farmer that starts using chemicals, okay, that's bad. Um, a person who doesn't hate their neighbor because of the color of the skin and starts doing it, that's bad. But a person who hates and finds a way to like the neighbor, that's good. It doesn't matter if they still got conventional farming systems and all of that, that already is a step in the right direction. A conventional farmer that puts a cover crop, that's already good. Okay, so let's understand that fundamental principle of, of, of a guiding principle uh, as, a, as, a, as a stepping stone. And then we are, I mean, the question is relating to someone and groups of people, groups of farmers who are already way, way on their path to, you know, they already passed the beginning stages of transformation of their own ways of thinking and all of that. To the extent that they are so close just being exposed to other ways in order to continue to change. All we have to do then is accelerate that change towards the final destination because they're already on their path. So absolutely, absolutely inspiring to hear that statement about natural foods and, and how, you know, um, how it's already happening because when, when someone that is already on that path I don't, I don't believe they will find any issue with furthering their own individual mission by becoming part of a true collective effort. And that understanding of their success and the definition of their success from the perspective of the collective success is so much easier to have a conversation about that with someone already in that position, with somebody whose idea of transformation and regenerative is putting cover crops or measuring soil organic matter. I have a deep appreciation for that. When I, you know, growing up in Iowa, that was, and I'm, you know, and I know you see that where you're at too. 
I know I, or when I lived there and I still know, I guess a number of farmers who would have neighbors like longtime neighbors, but they chose to put in, you know, confinements. And, you know, when I started, you know, and this, of course, I guess I'll go back to saying that. And so that would create a lot of division, just that alone, right, in the community. And you know, I think, so when I started out in doing my work and organizing, um, especially when um, this is an example, I guess it's coming to me for some reason, but back in 2009, the Department of Justice decided to launch an investigation, maybe you remember this, um, in antitrust laws and agriculture. And I traveled around the country throughout that whole year and went to all of those hearings. There was one here in Denver, um, right near where I live right now. And then there was uh, one in Wisconsin on dairy and, and then there was one in Alabama that was on poultry. And the one in poultry in Alabama, I, I couldn't talk about that. I don't know if I still can without tearing up because even though a lot of those growers were what we would call at that time conventional growers, like they had these large, you know, of course, houses that where they had a gazillion birds and it was, you know, not favorable conditions for those animals. What those produce, what those companies were doing to those humans, to the producers was absolutely heartbreaking. You know, driving a lot of fear into them and driving many of them to take their own lives and, you know, just putting them into a mountain of debt. But, and we had a lot of people in the community and the agriculture, the same sustainable food community really questioning us, like why we were standing with those poultry growers. And we said, well, why, why wouldn't we? You know, they're, they're humans, right? It's, it's not, it just isn't right. So when you talk about that right and wrong in that way, right? You, 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 have, to, you have to act in that way. I think, yeah, it still does bring me tears. It's a, there's a lot of, a lot of pain in that, in that world and suffering. So thank you for, thank you for bringing that forward. Um, here's another, um, uh, Adagio says, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if you can discuss more of the decision making process. I'm sorry, I missed this. Um, on each of these levels. This, this was something you were talking about right when you were done, it looks like. In my organizing experience, democratic processes can be co-opted even in situations where people have similar objectives and goals. So I'm wondering about that versus consensus-based models. Yeah, so consensus-based models, the way we traditionally understand is an imposition by rule. So we write into our constitution or bylaws or operating manuals and then turn them into regulations that require that everybody says yes in order to move forward in a decision. Now that, by the way, is not consensus. That's an imposed, an imposed rule. Consensus comes from everybody being in agreement that something is the best thing to do because it benefits the community, because it benefits them individually, because there is a collective outcome that is important for everyone. And as a result of that, we agree that we need to do something. But that something came, that something, that proposal on the table came from consensus about what is important to the community. That is a whole different thing than me putting something on the table and, and because we are required to all vote yes to move that forward, then either being blocked or move forward. So again, the consensus is, does not happen on a vote. It happens from an emergence of the understanding of what matters to the community. That is consensus. And then as a result of that, you don't have to even vote on a consensus-based process of governance. So let's not confuse, as a professor used to say in Guatemala, 
gymnasium with magnesium. They are not the same thing in any way, shape, or form. And consensus-based decision-making in the ancestral ways of indigenous governing structures had very little to do with consensus-based as in the, the systems we're building today where it is, um, what do you call, ordained or required. That's a, that's a different construct. And when we require 100% uh, vote in order to make a decision, we're going to complicate our lives infinitely. But when we decide what's best for the community on the basis of common goals and common objectives, which is the fundamental definition of a council, then by definition, you have consensus on what matters and consensus of the reason you have a governing structure to begin with. And so that allows us not to avoid this co-opting that um, Adagio is, is asking about, but it does inoculate us to a great extent from being co-opted. Co co -opted. And it's one of the reasons, uh, if you look at where these systems are being applied, you can look at the 48 villages, as it's called, los 48 cantones of Totonicapan in Guatemala. That is a system organized as close as I know to the, to the diagram and the blueprint that I laid out for you. And in fact, it was Totonicapan's Cedro, a community named Cedro, which is incorporated as a nonprofit, that actually generated the original the original diagram of the diagram that I laid out for you. Let me just show you that quickly. So this is the original diagram, okay? The outer circle that is blue here is the one that I represented as affinity groups. In this case, it's a full community system. It's not just about agriculture and farming. This is a full governance system that the Ukushwu, or the book of the heart, or the book of knowledge of the Maya. And these systems have protected Mayan communities since pre-Columbian time up to now from being co-opted. So if we're gonna talk about democratic systems being co-opted, maybe because we are talking about, about elected officials being co-opted who have been elected by us under what we call a democratic system. Yes, that is a different thing. But in Guatemala, for example, uh, the 48 cantones and their spokesperson, Martin, just spoke at the National Assembly, or not National Assembly, spoke at the National Palace with dignitaries from many countries. And he spoke about this ancestral ways now being the only answer for Guatemala as a country because of the complete failure of the state institutions that have been so fully co-opted that they no longer represent the interest of people. And so parallel to that, the communities were able to continue to revive and to re research, re-emerge, regenerate the ancestral governing systems. And today, the power is starting to shift from the central government to the indigenous ways. And it has not been, the, even the conventional government of the country, which is under the hands of the corporate oligarchs and all of that, fully co-opted and corrupted hasn't been able to corrupt the indigenous system to the extent that it would, that it would compromise it. So bottom line may not be perfect, but it is the best and most proving and tested system we have to avoid those pitfalls. Thank you. That brings up a lot of stuff for me. <laughs> I bet. Um, <laughs> I, cause you know, I think, I think that's what a lot of people think about. They like, you know, we live in, you know, most of us on this call, not everybody, 
Um, but most of us on this call live, you know, in the in the US. And, you know, my my organizing personally, I have my my own personal experience that I can speak from, um, you know, in doing a lot of political work, you know, in trying to change regulations at the USDA and the FDA and, you know, kind of pushing back on the administration. And, I, and those were during times where people felt like we had a really um, easy time, if you will, like under the Obama administration. And we still didn't, you know, have a large effect. If, you know, we had some effect in what we were doing. Um, but, you know, Obama, for example, approved more genetically engineered crops than any other president, you know? So a lot of people think, oh, you know, you're Democrat, you know, Republican, you know, whatever, it's gonna be different. And in my, you know, you know, in the weeds experience, it, it really wasn't a lot different when you kind of look at the outcome. So, and so for me, you know, as somebody who used to put a, you know, a decent amount of, of faith in our ability to change that, you know, in a democratic system, used to is the key word there. Um, I don't anymore. Um, people, people, you know, for a long time would say, well, then, you know, what is our, you know, what's our avenue? What's our avenue for, for change? And for me personally, the way that I've reconciled it is to go back to what my favorite saying was from the time I was in my early adulthood was be the change. And, you know, you see it everywhere, but I, I feel like that's truly the way to create that is by embodying it, right? Especially when you do look at, you know, the quantum aspects of it, if you will, you know, like our vibratory nature, right? And how we are all connected in that way. And so we, when we have that higher vibratory nature, I know I'm, I probably sound like I'm going off the reservation here a little bit, but um, <laughs> I, I, I did that path. And it, like I said, it didn't, it didn't result in a whole lot of change. Like in my home state of Iowa, for example, where I did a lot of that activism from. Um, mm. But as I have begun to embody that, my space around me, my community around, you know, my organism is, um, you know, what can organize that coherence, if you will. I was just talking with my daughter about this last night. I said, well, we all have our own sovereignty and autonomy. You know, we are, the way I see it, we are, you know, we are all a part of that consciousness of what we, you know, some of us call God, you know, and I'm not trying to be religious or stuff on anybody there, but that's, that's my understanding of it. And so we have the opportunity to engage with ourselves as we are looking at one another, right? In our physical spaces. And so I was talking about bringing that coherence, you know, to the spaces that we are in while still honoring, you know, the sovereignty of, of others. And it's, it's, um, it's a practice, you know, for me anyway, to master. And so getting that back to what you were saying about governance, um, I, you know, I have personally kind of struggled with that a little bit of how to quote change a system. And I've, in some ways I've, I've stopped worrying about it, you know, from that larger perspective. And I'm more like, what can I do here? How, what can I impact here? And then those other fear, spheres of influence, meaning other humans, right? I can, I can maybe have an impact with them. Like that beacon, that lighthouse, that is often the, the, the symbolism of what I try to embody myself. Because fighting against oh. doesn't have much of an impact for me. Right, and, and, and Bill does another follow-up question there, which is right up to your point, is uh, uh, what I mean is how do we create regulations rather than react to ones imposed? Do yeah. we just ignore the regulations and act as if we make the way of doing things? Well, here's what happens. Regulations are made by us. We may not realize it, but regulations respond to what we do. If nobody, if nobody used the internet, there would be no conversation about regulating the internet. Their internet had to exist before we could create regulations. Conventional yeah. agriculture had to exist in order for there to be regulations. So no, we don't have any obligation to react to existing 
regulations. What we do need to know is what are the regulations because then, because we need to operate within that framework uh, or we end up in a position of doing things illegal, illegally. And then that becomes a reason for us to be turned into defending ourselves instead of focusing on doing. So very important differentiation there. Strategically, is that is one of the things we gotta keep a sharp eye on, understand the regulations, but you don't have to, to, to try to change them. What you need, we need to do is create regulations. And how do we do that? Well, let me give you a simple example. Mm -hmm. On October last year, our poultry system in Southern Minnesota was approved for a, a state appropriation under the bonding bill. Now that's regulation that has an impact. We didn't go try to react to any regulation. We didn't try to go and propose any, any new regulatory framework. We proposed a very simple solution and to, a, um, to the situation that farmers are living every day. And we proposed that as a business opportunity to tap into a new area of economic opportunity for developing and capturing value for our, the farmers in our region. I mean, who's gonna be in disagreement with that? By the way, the first 29 representatives and senators that supported us were all Republican. Mm -hmm. And it was only after that, the Democrats started to join. Just to give you an idea of the level of interest that there is in the legislatures across the country and at the, gov at the, at the federal level, to actually make policies and to support the kind of work we want to do. It's just how you approach it. The approach, the strategy is the name of the game. Now, what happens as a result though? How do we make policy then? So take our case. Every chicken we raise sells for between 18 and $20. So round it up to $20. A single farm can produce around 32,000 chickens. Now at $20, a piece that's six hundred and forty thousand dollars worth of market impact. Okay, now keep that in, that number in mind. Round it down to six hundred for 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 math purposes, so that we can be more straightforward. Now, we consume around twenty chickens per capita in this country, um, and that is already balanced out in average with vegans and vegetarians and all that. So, in average, we consume twenty. Now, times twenty. I'm 20, 330 or so million people. And it gives you about, I think it's 6 billion chickens that we consume in this country. Wow. Take 5% of that, and that will be the equivalent of the total population. That's 330 or so million chickens. Mm -hmm. Okay, now 330 um, million chickens timed, say, Five dollars that that each conventional chicken roughly costs to consumers. That's one point six five billion dollars. Now, if we were to divide one point six five billion dollars, uh, I can't do it on my phone because it's too much. But if if you if you follow that, so you take one single chicken or one single farm at $600,000 of market impact and, and divide 5% of the market at 330 chickens, 300 and, I mean, 330 million chickens, um, what we have is 32,000 chickens capturing 600 or so thousand dollars of market. And then if you start aggregating that across a multitude of small farms, it doesn't take more than one region to capture in excess of $1 billion worth of market share. Now, we haven't yet talked about large farms. Not a single farm is over 32,000 chickens. Not a single farm is more than 15 acres. Not a single farm is discriminated against small farms or, or people with low income or immigrants who can't afford a 100 acre farm. We haven't yet done a single thing to discriminate against anyone. And we just built a blueprint for taking away about $7.5 billion worth of market share. But that's only the cost of the chicken, the market of the chicken. Now each chicken, 32,000 chickens per, per farm, each one consuming 12 pounds of feed 
that's 384,000 pounds of feed. Now times that uh, 35%, that's 134,400 pounds of corn in a similar amount of soybean. Now we can then flip that production to neighboring farms, to farms within the collective, and to ensure that it's, the loop closes so that they are permanently um, uh, not only organized as, a, as an affinity group as grain growers, but also directly connected to the affinity group of the broader group. And as a result of that, we get to take every single dollar and we, we, we multiply its value by around 10 times in average. Now at 10 times in average, that is $200 per chicken. That's the economic ripple impact. Wow. A $5 chicken that is sold by a conventional brand in the market has a 0.75 cent per dollar impact. That's why we have to subsidize the remaining of it because they lose, they have a negative impact. Well, we have for every $20 that we capture out of the market, we got a $200 impact. So it will take one tenth of the effort to transform the market and to make policy. Well, to do that, we have to stop thinking individually. We must understand what it means to have a collective impact. And it is quantifiable, it is measurable, and it is attainable. But the reason all the propaganda and the mass manipulation is focused on dividing us is because they know, these institutions know that the greatest threat to their power is our ability to consume the world as individual organisms, because collectively we can regenerate it. And regenerating it means they cannot extract wealth out of us and the ecosystems anymore. And that means they would have to change and change is what they will never do voluntarily. That's why we, can, we have to build a system that will replace it. Hoping to change it is futile. That we have to understand. And so that, that gives us the, that insurgent power that we need. And if we are faithful and systemic about this, we will prevail. But it, 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 you, you have to understand what we're up against. And yeah, some yeah. days it doesn't feel like we can do this, honestly. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what is our choice? People like us, we are true insurgents. We will die doing this. And if you're willing to do that, you know, we will die, not I guess we're gonna get killed, but like it happens in other countries, but because we will die of old age, um, doing the same, we'll die honorably, we'll have a fulfilled, beautiful life. And as a result of that, hopefully the next generation can take it from there. And if we move the rock sufficiently around the hill to get to the other side, the next generation hopefully gets it there or the following. You have to think in multiple generations because our worst enemy is not the economy, is not the land, is not the animals, it's none of those things. Our worst enemy is our their own culture of colonization that we have built. And just like we built it, we can also build a different one. That different one is the one we got to focus on, not react to the current one. So thanks for your time. Bravo. That was that's a wonderful place to end on. We're we're unfortunately at time. This was just a really wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Will you will you tell people where they can find you, where they can, you know, plug in with you more and your website and, and all of that? I already did. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear you very well <laughs> at the beginning, so I apologize. No, I put it on the on the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for be, being a continued part of the Soil and Nutrition Conference. It's been just a, a wonderful blessing and inspiration to have you here with us. Thank you. This is a great opportunity. And check out the chat. It's really live and beautiful notes there. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.